I want to start today by thanking the sponsor for the Cafe Sci series. H.M. Payson is a Maine-based financial advisor who has supported the Cafe Sci series um, for the last few seasons. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, okay, so today um, in this presentation, if you have questions, um, please use the Q&A button that's in your Zoom screen to submit your written questions and I will try to answer them at the end. Um, I can't see them in real time, so we'll save all the questions for the end. Throughout the talk, you also will get little prompts for survey questions. Um, these are just uh, to interact with the presentation a little bit. Um, they're not recorded, don't worry. Um, uh, so I hope you enjoy those. Okay, so tonight I will be talking to you about Deep Sea Frontiers, which is um, uh, the deep sea is what I study. I am a senior research scientist at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. Um, Bigelow Laboratory is a nonprofit research institute and um, it's the support of our uh, donors and board members who help make our science happen in addition to our grants. So thank you to everybody that has been a supporter of us in the past. Um, it really helps our research. And I'd also like to acknowledge that Bigelow and where I work is on the traditional homeland of um, the Abenaki Nation of the Wawanaki Confederacy. And I've been trying to think a lot about how um, anti-colonialism and anti-racism should be a stronger part of my science. And I would welcome any questions related to that. So let's take the big picture view. This is planet Earth as seen from satellite imagery showing us this beautiful blue planet that we call home. Uh, and we can see our oceans and the land masses quite clearly from these imagery um, and these photographs. But we actually have pretty poor maps of our Earth when you take away all the water. And look at the seafloor below. We actually have better maps of Mars and other planets than we do of 70% of Earth's solid surface. So here's your first survey question. How much of the seafloor do you think has been mapped at high resolution with modern techniques? So you have four choices. 10%, uh, 20%, 60%, or 100%. So go ahead and vote if you feel like it. Um, we'll give you a couple more seconds. Okay, so are you ready for the answer? <laughs> you can go ahead and end the poll. So it looks like, oh, you are even more pessimistic. <laughs> we are actually at 20% of the seafloor has been mapped at high resolution with modern standards. Um, so this is actually a big deal because it means there's a lot of our seafloor that we don't know about. Uh, there may be features that we don't know about, habitats that we don't know about, and there's actually an international program to try and improve that um, called Seabed 2030 that has a mission to try to map all of Earth's seafloor um, by the year 2030 in the next 10, uh, 10 years. And so when we think about what we don't know and what we haven't seen, uh, here's a kind of granular view of our seafloor if you remove the water. And you can see that there's a lot of features of our seafloor, uh, including underwater mountains that form along mid-ocean ridges where two ocean plates are pulling apart. So that represents kind of that uh, brown seam you see running through the Atlantic Ocean and partially through the Eastern Pacific. So new seafloors being formed, you have underwater volcanoes. Um, uh, it's a really dynamic environment. But in some of those places, we don't have good imagery um, or maps of uh, the features on those mountains. And so imagine on land, if you couldn't see, for instance, a hillside, um, that's kind of what we're dealing with. We also have all these underwater mountains over in the Western Pacific and in other places, um, sea mounts that have formed. And there's also really deep places in our seafloor um, at the trenches. So for instance, along the Western rim of the Pacific there, where two plates are pushing into each other and one of them is sliding underneath. That's called subduction. And so some of those sites are about six miles deep um, and we have very little imagery from those places. So that means a lot of our seafloor is left to explore. A lot of earth is left to explore. And I've been really fortunate in my career to have been able to explore some of these places in submarines um, and submersibles and also using robots. Um, every dive to the seafloor is really a magical, otherworldly experience. Um, it's what I imagine going to another planet might be like, seeing places for the first time, finding new animal species, um, seeing underwater volcanoes spewing out hot water. Um, and so here's an example of what that might look like. Um, this is a video from the Picard vents. It's the deepest known hydrothermal vents on Earth. 
this black smoke that you kind of see here, that's hydrothermal fluids, really high temperature water, full of metals, um, and those metals precipitate to form these structures. There are microbes that live in those environments that can use those chemicals for energy and then support the base of a really diverse and thriving ecosystem of unique animals like those shrimp you just saw in those um, earlier pictures. So a lot left down there to find out about. My research group focuses on studying microscopic life that lives on rocks on the seafloor. So this picture gives an example of that. There are microbes in this basalt, basalt's kind of like lava, that can use iron as an energy source and they precipitate rust as a byproduct. And you can kind of see those little rusticles throughout the rock. And we use a variety of approaches to study those microbes, including really high powered microscopy. So this is an image that we've taken here at Bigelow Lab where we can zoom in on those microbes. Each one of those is about one micrometer in diameter or about the thousandth of the width of a human hair. So we can see uh, what they look like and we can see how many of them there are. But just using microscopy, you can't tell which, what microbe, uh, what micro they are. Are they different microbes? Are they all the same? Unlike animals, you can't really tell microbes apart by how they look. So we need to look at their DNA and, and to figure out who they are. And again, at Bigelow Lab, we have really great techniques for doing this. Um, so before wearing masks was really fashionable uh, in COVID times. Uh, this is something that we already would do at Bigelow in the single cell genomic center and I flow, excuse me, flow cytometry facility where we sort individual microbes out of environmental samples um, using a technique called flow cytometry that sorts out one cell at a time. Uh, and then we can uh, query the DNA of those individual cells. So this is a really unique technique that we have here at Bigelow with the Single Cell Genomic Center. And it allows us to explore these strange microbes. Now you might think, why is this interesting? Who cares? Well, one of the things that inspires me to do my research is that the reactions that happen between rocks and seawater at the bottom of the ocean on Earth might be similar reactions that are occurring in other bodies in our solar system, like Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, and Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. So they um, might have similar rock uh, and fluid chemistries that allow similar reactions to happen. And so by understanding the microbes that can live on those reactions in our own ocean, we can think about how life might exist on these other planets and give us ideas of what to look for on those other planets to figure out if life is there. So some of the research that we do at Bigelow is funded by NASA for those purposes. But what I want to talk to you about is like why you should care <laughs> about these rocks um, at the bottom of the ocean and um, what meaning they might have for you. So you might not think about rocks from the bottom of the ocean very often, um, so I'd like to introduce you to some of them. Uh, this rock that you're looking at here is what's called a manganese nodule or a ferromanganese nodule. It's a rock that is um, a, a dense uh, a precipitation that's formed over many, many uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of years, slowly accreting uh, these uh, metal layers. And it has metal content, which doesn't seem like a lot. It has 0.25% cobalt, but that actually from a, um, ecologic, uh, sorry, an economic point of view is actually a pretty high percentage of cobalt in a ore on land. Um, and so if you were interested in finding sources of things like cobalt and copper uh, and or nickel um, and even manganese, these uh, rocks at the bottom of the ocean actually have some economic value. Why would we do that? Why do we care about those metals? Well, metals like these are what are needed for the transition to our fossil free, fossil free future. Um, they are used in lithium ion batteries. They are used in solar panels to make them work, um, et cetera. There's a lot of technologies that use these metals that are found in these types of rocks. Uh, and so if we want more of these technologies, we need to have a source for these metals. Uh, just to give you an example of how much this uh, demand is growing. Uh, here's some data that was um, uh, put together to show the growth in demand for lithium ion batteries in tons um, uh, over the last 
uh, five years and projecting out to the next uh, five years. And you see that there's a prediction growth in electric cars, right? More and more people want electric vehicles. And so that's driving increasing demand for lithium ion batteries. And as I mentioned, lithium ion batteries have these other metals. So here's some examples of the um, alloy content um, in lithium ion batteries. Some of these additional metals that are essential for these lithium ion batteries to work. So for instance, a, a Tesla, uh, the electric um, uh, battery in that car also has aluminum, it has quite a bit of cobalt, and it has nickel. Uh, your iPhone, if you have an iPhone or some other type of uh, handheld phone device, it probably has a lithium ion battery that has a lot of cobalt in it, percentage wise. And more and more uh, consumers are buying um, devices, lithium ion batteries for their own home to store energy that's generated from solar power um, or wind power if you have your own turbine. Uh, and so these also contain these metals. So here's the next survey question for you. A multiple choice question. How many pounds of cobalt do you think are in an average electric car battery? So you have three choices there. You have uh, less than one, per, one pound up to a pound. Option two or option B is two to three pounds or option C, four to 17 pounds. So go ahead and make your guess. The, I can see the numbers flickering back and forth. Okay, so let's go ahead and end that poll and see what the answer is. So it seems that most of you guessed two to three pounds. The answer is that the average car battery has about four to 17 pounds. And currently with the current usage of cobalt, that represents about 40% of the global demand for cobalt um, is for going into these batteries. So just think about that uh, as we discuss further uh, the growth of these consumer products. So I mentioned that there's an interest in trying to maybe extract some of these minerals from the C4 because they have this economic value. And here is a schematic of what that might look like. It's essentially a machine that would go along the seafloor in an area where you have these manganese nodules. It would scoop up those nodules and then ship them up to the surface of the ocean to a ship. The ship would then bring that ore to land to be processed and go into our manufacturing pipeline. Uh, this was stylized in this cartoon. When I was a student, this was kind of a sci-fi idea, but in the last five to 10 years, it's really taken on as an actual um, industry with investment um, and uh, ideas for moving it forward. So you might be asking yourself, where are these things on the seafloor? Are they here in the Gulf of Maine? So I'm gonna walk you through this map of where these different resources are on the seafloor. So first, all the countries are um, blanked out in white and you'll notice this light blue color that rims the countries um, in the map. Those are delineating what are called exclusive economic zones that um, every country has the right to do what they want to in, that, um, in the land that's under blue. And everything else that's in gray is considered international water. Within those, um, there are three different uh, resource types that I want to highlight. And we'll start first with sulfides. So those are labeled with these kind of red dots. And you might remember from the earlier map, they kind of fall along the center of the mid-ocean ridges, those places where I said ocean plates are pulling apart, and you have these underwater volcanoes and underwater hydrothermal vents. So you can see there's some in the mid-Atlantic, there's some in the Eastern Pacific, there's also some in the Indian Ocean. So again, to remind you what those look like, these are places where you have had hot water spewing out of the seafloor. Um, that hot water is full of metals and those metals precipitate when they come into contact with the cold seawater at the bottom of the ocean. And that leads to these structures being formed and as you remember from that video, there's lots of animals that live on these um, uh, structures and those animals are getting their food from the microbes that are able to convert some of that chemical energy into carbon and then they become the base of the food chain. So unique animal ecosystems are, live on these uh, active sulfides. As the vents move away from the axis, as the plates start pulling apart, um, those vents become inactive the structures still exist um, with all the metals precipitated, but there may not be as much hydrothermal flow, maybe even no flow. The uniqueness of the animals that live on extinct sulfides isn't really well known. So we don't know if they're unique or kind of generic. 
The next resource I want to talk to you about are called Cobalt Crests. So um, you'll see those highlighted in these orange blobs throughout the map uh, with a largest, the largest concentration of them in the Eastern Pacific. The Eastern Pacific has a lot of those underwater mountains and they're relatively old. They formed a long time ago in uh, geologic history. Um, and so what those environments are, they're these underwater mountains where these rocks are exposed. And because those rocks have been exposed for a really, really, really long time, layers and layers of metals have precipitated on the outside of those rocks. And you can kind of see that in this black, uh, rusty color on the outside of these rocks. You'll see there's a lot of octopus in this picture as well. I'm going to talk about those octopus a little bit later. But that's what a cobalt crest is. And then the third resource where these minerals um, are, are what are those manganese nodules. So I showed you some examples of those already. Those are highlighted in these purple blobs on this map. And you'll see that they kind of uh, are located kind of in the centers um, of um, uh, ocean and the Pacific or in the Atlantic between land and where those mid-ocean ridges are. And again, this is kind of a, a picture of what one of these manganese nodule fields look like. Each one of those rocks is maybe the size of a potato um, and they can be very dense in some areas. Okay, the final thing on this map that I'd like to highlight to you are these areas that are colored in green. These are areas that have already been contracted for exploration to various um, states uh, to explore for the potential for deep sea mining. So you'll see most of those are in the um, Pacific Ocean in between Hawaii and the US. And I'd just like to point out that scale for you that that entire manganese nodule field is um, equivalent in length to the entire contiguous United States. So it's a very large area of the seafloor that has been contracted for exploration, uh, akin to exploring all of the US for these types of resources. And there's other contracted areas in mid-ocean ridges, et cetera, but those are smaller. They don't show up at this map as well. And if you'd like to know more about this, um, I uh, mentioned a paper there that you can have a look at. Okay, so conceptually, there are those three different habitats that I talked about. And here's a cartoon showing some of those habitats and emphasizing the role that microbes play in those habitats. So on the left side, you see some of these uh, hydrothermal vent ecosystems, the places where the hot water spews out of the seafloor. And we know that microbes play an important role in cycling some of the chemicals in the hot water and converting that into food for the animals and the unique, uh, the unique animals that live in those environments. Uh, towards the right side of that figure, you see an example of those manganese nodule fields and an example of one of those little mining machines going through it. We don't know how important microbes are in those ecosystems yet because they have been poorly studied. But we think that they play an important role in um, supporting the food web, in nutrient recycling, uh, and other processes. Um, so what do we know about what the impacts might be about deep sea mining and trying to capture some of these uh, metals? So there was a study done a few years ago by some colleagues where um, Back in the 80s, a, uh, an experiment was done off the coast of Peru to explore what, it, what mining impacts might look like. And so they ex did an experimental trawl through a manganese nodule field to kind of replicate what a mining extraction might look like. And then they went back to that seafloor 35 years later to see what it looked like. So in the upper left-hand corner, you can see an example of what kind of healthy uh, manganese nodule fields look like, and you can see some animals in that ecosystem like the purple sea cucumber. There's a sea sponge in the back. In the upper right, you can see an example of kind of background seafloor that's also healthy. And we know that because you can see all those little animal trails in the, um, in the sediment. It looks like things have been kind of wiggling around there. If you contrast that then to the picture at the bottom, which is what the seafloor like, looks like in the area that was experimentally trawled and when they went back to visit it 35 years later. And what you can see is that there's no happy little trails in the mud. It doesn't look like there's many animals. And so the takeaway from this experiment or this study is that within 35 years, like within human lifetimes, <laughs> these ecosystems will not recover to what they were like before impact. There's also been a really recent study done by some other colleagues of mine to look at the microscopic life in these type of um, test scenarios. 
So what I'm showing you here is a summary of some of their data where um, uh, samples that were not uh, impacted are labeled in green. Samples that were impacted 26 years ago, so several decades ago, are in the kind of yellow to orange colors in the middle. And then the most recently impacted samples are highlighted in red. And I'm just showing you one example here of one of the metrics that they wanted to use to assess microbial ecosystem health. And that is what's called carbon fixation. So the ability of microbes to take carbon dioxide and convert it into organic matter using um, uh, a similar type of process as what plants use for photosynthesis. So they're taking up CO2 and they're converting it into organic matter. And that's really important for the base of the food chain. You're creating new food. And so what you can see in this graph here is that the unimpacted um, uh, sediments have the highest carbon fixation and you still see impact in samples that were impacted decades ago and then really severe impacts to the most recently um, uh, impacted sediment. So this is our first indication that mining type disturbances will also have decade long effects on even the smallest forms of life in these ecosystems. Uh, and this paper just recently came out in Science Advances. Um, so data like this is what we need to understand whether or not there are gonna be impacts from this type of human activity in the deep sea. Um, and so there's a range of services that microbes can provide in an ecosystem. I was talking to you about carbon fixation and being the base of the food web. There are other examples like the ability of microbes to use carbon is also a form of carbon sequestration. Microbes are really important for recycling nutrients that other animals need, um, uh, et cetera. And so my colleagues and I recently put together a white paper um, that came out earlier this year to try to quantitatively assess what we know and don't know about the services that microbes provide in the deep sea. And I'm showing you here a picture of that assessment. So each column here represents a different habitat from those active hydrothermal vents to those manganese nodule fields. And each row represents a different type of service that microbes could provide. So for example, that top orange row is whether or not microbes are essential for the animals to be in that ecosystem. And so for active vents, um, those hydrothermal vents, we know that animals are really essential for those my, uh, animals. Oh, sorry, the microbes are essential for the animals. Um, because they form really tight symbioses. And so if you lose the microbes, you will definitely lose the animals. Um, so we labeled that as something that's really critical, it's very vulnerable, and it's pretty well understood. If you contrast that to some of the other habitats, we have less information, but we also don't have a good idea of whether or not it's critical. Um, as a different example, if you look at that first row that's blue colored, about whether or not microbes are important um, because they provide nutrient recycling. Uh, we're not sure if that's important at active hydrothermal vents, but for instance, in the manganese nodule areas, that is another critical uh, uh, feature that microbes provide and that could be vulnerable to deep sea mining. So the takeaway from this is basically to provide a roadmap for the type of studies that are needed to better understand the vulnerabilities of these ecosystems um, and definitely more studies are needed and that's what my research group will be focusing on over the next few years hopefully. And one of the reasons that we need these additional studies is because every time we go to the bottom of the ocean we find new things. So I'm showing you here a video of um, uh, one of these uh, sea mounts that has these cobalt crests that we explored off the coast of Costa Rica. And we were going there to look for evidence of low temperature fluid flow. And we found that, you can kind of see it with a shimmering in the video. That's an indication of hot water coming out. What we were not expecting to find was that octopus brewed their eggs in these areas where this flow occurs. So we essentially discovered an octopus nursery um, at this seamount. Subsequently, other researchers have found similar behaviors at other types of seamounts. And so this is a new question. Is this unique to these seamounts? Are other seamounts have this feature? Um, the um, low temperature fluid flow wasn't really appreciated as a, a, a process occurring at some of these seamounts. And so we need more information to figure this out. Another uh, natural capital that deep sea microbes provide in these habitats 
is that the microbes that are there are relatively unique compared to what we find on the surface of Earth, which means that they have a reservoir of novel genetic information that we could maybe explore to have other benefits for humanity. So as an example, microbes that have been isolated from deep sea hydrothermal vents have already been demonstrated to have antibiotic properties. Some of them have anti-cancer properties. Uh, a variety of the compounds that are generated by these um, uh, microbes have cosmeceutical benefits. So they're used in like facial creams, et cetera. And they also are the source of industrial enzymes. And so if we were to remove or destroy some of those ecosystems, we could lose that genetic novelty and the benefit that it might have for humanity. So you might be asking yourself, well, who gets to decide whether or not we're going to mine this or not? Um, and so I come back to this map of who manages all of this area in the international ocean and decides whether or not some place gets a contracted area or not. So I won't go into the nitty gritty details, but I will tell you that who manages it is um, an agency called the International Seabed Authority. And it's a subset or it was established by the UN as part of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. So now is your next survey question. This is a yes or no question. Is the US a signatory to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea? So just a yes or no question. Do you think we are or are we not? I'll give you a few seconds to decide. Okay, let's see what you decided. I'm going to end the poll. So it seems that about 70% of you think that the answer is no, and you would be correct. The, UN, uh, the US has not signed the Convention on the Law of the Sea. What that means is that the US cannot be a contractor in the international um, seafloor to have access to these minerals, although US-based companies could be part of a contracted team with another, country, uh, with another state. Uh, so it's a little complicated, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the question and answer period. Uh, so this International Seabed Authority, it has a mandate to manage the mineral resources in the international area as the common heritage of mankind, and it must be managed in the interest of mankind. Um, and so that means there needs to be kind of a cost-benefit analysis of, is it uh, best to manage this and mine this resource or to save it for future generations or to do something else with it? Uh, and so my role as a scientist is to help advise uh, agencies like the International Seabed Authority on what we know or don't know about the seafloor and whether uh, mining would be impactful. And I do that through programs like the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative that unites scientists from all over the world to provide this opinion. Um, and I'm showing you here an example of my colleague, Dr. Diva Aman, who leads the working group uh, within um, the DOSI program to help us get our voice in front of policymakers. Uh, not necessarily advocating one way or the other, but to provide the best science to guide their, um, their decision making. Okay, so now you might be asking yourself like, well, is this really such a big deal? Why should I care about this? And so I wanted to try to scale this potential impact compared to other impacts that you might be thinking about. So if you remember those green uh, blocks I showed you on the map, that area represents over 2 million square kilometers that has already been contracted for exploration. So it doesn't mean that mining is happening in that much space, and it doesn't mean that all that space will be mined, but it means that much space on the seafloor has been contracted to allow people to explore for mineral resources. Let's compare that to other impacts. So bottom trawling for fish annually probably impacts about a million square kilometers. So this area represents twice as much area as we impact for all the global fishing uh, that requires bottom trawling. Likewise, if you think of all of the mines and all of the quarries on land, they represent about 400,000 square kilometers. So deep sea mining is about five times that potential impact if all of that area was mined. And as another example, another impact on the seafloor um, is the laying of seabed cables. You've never heard of that term. That is what's allowing most of the internet to happen and the, trans, um, the transfer of information from country to country. It's not happening via satellite. Most of it's happening underwater. Um, that impact is about 1,200 square kilometers. So deep sea mining would obviously um, be a much larger impact. So just keep that in mind when thinking about the potential scale of this impact. Okay, 
So I wanted to make sure that I brought this all home to many of the viewers who I think are from Maine, although we also have people coming from elsewhere. So back to the same map, highlighting where Maine is, you can see that none of those mineral resources I was talking about are in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so is this something that we should think about? Um, and I'd like to think that it is, because as many of you may know, um, and I'm happy to tell you if you don't, with over the last year, there's been a lot of effort in what's called the Maine Climate Council uh, that brings together state policymakers, scientists, people from industry, um, et cetera, to think about how Maine could become carbon neutral by 2045, um, which would essentially entail reducing our carbon emissions 45% um, uh, within the next 10 years, um, or 45% below what it was in 1990 in the next 10 years, and then refer to a further 80% by 2050. And so an example goal of that is the, to uh, essentially electrify um, our uh, electrical grid to be more generated from renewables like wind and solar instead of, for instance, petroleum, natural gas, et cetera. So that's going to mean a huge demand for all of these technologies that I talked about earlier in the talk. Um, so more windmills, more solar panels, and uh, an electrified um, vehicle fleet. And all of that's going to mean increasing metal demand. Um, and so uh, the demand for these uh, metals in the rocks I talked about is going to accelerate even more. You might be asking yourself, like, why, are, why is Maine talking about this? Why do we have this climate council? Um, and so just to remind you that Maine is getting warmer um, and it's projected to get even warmer in the next few decades. So um, this projection from the scientific and technical committee that's part of the Maine Climate Council put together this graph showing the trajectory that Maine might be feeling like Rhode Island um, within the next few decades. And again, that this warming is due to fossil fuel emissions. This warming doesn't just make it more discomfortable, uh, uncomfortable to be outside, but it also causes sea level rise, which is leading already to storm surges um, in Maine, increasing storm surges. This is a picture from uh, Vital Haven uh, from the Island Institute showing an example of this where the storm surges are impacting our working waterfront. And an additional threat of more warming is that lobster don't necessarily like warm water, and so they will probably continue to migrate north. Um, and as you can see in this graph of the um, fishery landings for the state of Maine, lobster makes up the majority of our um, uh, offshore fishery economy. And so if our lobsters migrate north, that could also have a big impact to um, Maine livelihoods. So let's think about what are the biggest sources of carbon emissions in Maine? And here is your next survey question. Do you think, yes or no, that Maine has the highest dependence on heating oil in the US? So let's pop up that survey. Everybody gets a chance to vote. Oh, it's really fun for me to see the, the numbers going back and forth. Um, so give everybody a chance, hopefully. Yes, yes or no? Yes, we have the highest dependence, or no, we don't. All right, so it looks like most of the votes are in, and the majority of you said yes, and you would be correct. Maine does have the highest dependence on heating oil. And actually, our highest emissions for the state come from heating and from transportation. This may not be a surprise to you that live in Maine, uh, thinking that Maine is a rural state and that Mainers drive quite a bit. And so if you look at this pie chart on the right, we're breaking down the energy consumption, um, all those consumption in the state by sector. So transportation makes up the biggest source of our emissions uh, with residential coming second and a majority of that residential is from heating. And if you look at how we generate that energy in Maine, you'll see that the majority of our sources are fossil fuel based products with a growing amount of renewables. And again, the Maine Climate Council suggests that this should grow even more. So some of the biggest targets of the Maine Climate Council are to electrify our vehicle fleet and to encourage more and more um, uh, adaptation of um, uh, heating sources that don't require heating oil, like heating pumps, et cetera. OK, so I've bombarded you with a lot of information. And now I want to make sure that you feel like there's something you can do about what you've learned. So I'm not trying to suggest that we should not have electrical vehicles because 
they will drive uh, demand for metals, which might make deep sea mining more and more economically attractive. Um, what I will suggest, though, is that we all need to be mindful about how we can do this in the best way. Uh, so one of the first things I would suggest is that any of you who are from Maine, or even if you're from elsewhere, um, to look at what the Maine Climate Council is actually working on, and you can share your thoughts. Um, you can take a survey, you can learn more about what's being suggested. Um, I should put in a disclaimer here that I am in no way actually affiliated with this Climate Council. I'm not an advisor to it. I don't serve on it, although some of my colleagues do. Um, I'm just a Maine citizen who finds this interesting. Um, other things that you can do as a consumer who might be considering getting some of these products because you want to get off fossil fuels. Things that we could do to lessen the demand and the burden on deep sea mining is that if we encourage lithium ion battery recycling in a much stronger way than we currently do in this country, we could eliminate some of that demand for some of those metals. So actually the largest source of many of the metals I've talked about are in landfills, but right now they are not uh, uh, in a way that is easy for them to be recycled. And so if we think about this ahead of time, about how to better recycle these batteries and extend their use, that is one way we could lower that demand. And so if consumers push for that, um, that will be more of a reality. Second, we can all try to support development of better battery chemistry. That doesn't require so many metals. There's many companies that are trying to work on this because they want to make cheaper batteries as well. Um, and so the more that we can promote that, um, the lower the demand for those metals would be. And that would be important for both lowering the demand for mining on land as well as for deep sea mining. Uh, so please never throw away your electronics. Don't put them in the garbage. Um, there are ways to recycle them. In Maine, there's a program called Call to Recycle where you can find out information about where to deposit your electronics, uh, old phones, old laptops, et cetera, um, so that they can be put to their best use uh, as a second life. Okay, so I've given you a lot of information. I would love to continue the conversation through our question and answer period. If I don't have time to answer your question or you think of something later tonight, you can find me on Twitter at Deep Microbe. Um, but hopefully I've given you a sense for why rocks at the bottom of the ocean are so fascinating and some of the animals that um, depend on these ecosystems and how vulnerable they might be to deep sea mining type impacts. And with that, uh, I thank you for watching. Um, I welcome your questions. Um, my colleague Stephen will be reading questions that have been submitted. Um, so if you still have a question, please go ahead and write it in using the Q&A button. Um, and let's let's go Stephen. please read me the first question great thanks beth great talk um first question is about when you think that the curves for the cost of mining and the market value will cross making it economically vi viable and which metals will they cross will cross that threshold first that's a fun question uh so i would say for some metals we've already crossed that threshold uh the most um so cobalt is often used as a metric for whether or not this is economically viable. And companies have already been able to raise you know, venture capital to explore the seafloor, to explore creating mining machines, um, and to explore new um, you know, ore uh, smelting processes and design new ships that are gonna be needed for this. So industry already thinks this is economically viable. Otherwise, they would not be investing this money. Um, and uh, that the interest in that could change over time if there are, for instance, major changes to battery chemistry that might make the demand for cobalt go down, et cetera. So that there is some volatility in that market. Uh, I didn't talk much about what are called rare earth elements. Um, those are things that are in relatively low concentration. Well, that's why they're called rare. But because they're so rare, they're incredibly valuable. And so those also are um, a metal market that um, some, can, some industry leaders look at to see if this is economically viable. And that's kind of why I said when I was a student, this was presented as like a pipe dream, but the economics of it have changed so rapidly in the last few years to make this actually a, a, an industry that people are investing money in. Thanks for the question. Is there another one, Stephen? Yeah, uh, next one is uh, kind of a follow-up to that, but 
are there extensive sources of some of these minerals on land making seabed extraction more of an option than a necessity? Uh, yeah, so um, the answer to that question um, is not black and white. So there are some resource uh, like economists who think that the land-based reserves are still high enough and accessible enough that deep sea mining um, wouldn't make sense to try to capture those metals. Whereas for other metal markets and other um, resource economists have a different point of view and they think that um, the ore qual quality of rocks on the seafloor is better than what's left remaining in mines on land, in ore deposits on land. Part of the um, value equation also relates to stability, right? So right now, some of the metals that we use and that are mined come from company, come, sorry, come from countries that are unstable or that um, maybe have a, a, you know, a lockdown on the market and they're not um, friendly to um, sharing those metals, let's say. And so that might also change the interest in getting them from deep sea mining. We also have to think, if you remember back to what I said about managing these international resources for the common benefit of mankind. And some developing countries, especially island nations in the Pacific Ocean, see deep sea mining as a potential benefit for their countries because they don't have access to these minerals on their you know, small atoll islands. Um, and so that's also part of the conversation in terms of how do we be equitable about distributing the value so that it's not just Western nations that benefit from this uh, metal extraction, which is what typically dominates on land. I hope I answered that question. <laughs> Great, thanks Beth. Uh, does the U.S. have seafloor mineral resources that it can mine? Ooh, okay. Um, so if we remember back to that map, and let me try to pull it up here real quick, if I can. I'm on a different computer, so it might take me a second. Okay, let's, hopefully everybody can see this map again. Uh, so if you look in the U.S. exclusive economic zone, so the light blue that rings around the U.S., there's not a lot of mineral resources in our exclusive economic zone. There's some of these seamounts on the, um, off the coast of California, and there's thought to be maybe some of those mineral resources also within the exclusive economic zone of the US and the Pacific around some of the um, uh, uh, countries that we partner with and around Hawaii, et cetera. But there's not a lot. In the last two years, the, um, the White House has actually put out an executive order that all government agencies need to prioritize better mapping in the U.S. exclusive economic zone to get a better sense of the characterization of our minerals. Um, so there's not a lot. And again, as I mentioned, since we're not a signatory to the law of the sea, the U.S. cannot be a contractor state for resources in international waters. So all those contract blocks you see in the Pacific Ocean are countries, uh, you know, lots of European countries, African countries, uh, Pacific Island nations, uh, China, Japan, etc. Um, but none are from the U.S. There are some U.S. companies that are involved in helping to do exploration, but they're not the contractor. Um, so I hope I answered that question. Thanks. Uh, next question is just about the comparison with mining on land and that it's very polluting and wondering if mining in the sea is more polluting. Yeah, this is a fun question that we've been trying to tackle with our partners in uh, the International Seabed Authority is thinking about this idea of pollution. Um, and that uh, when we think about pollution, we think about it both from an environmental sense as well as its impact on humans. So clearly mines on land have a higher potential to impact human health um, through dust, through uh, water quality, uh, through movement of communities that live above those uh, mines, etc. And the long-term, uh, you know, decommissioning of a mine, etc., can have pollution impacts. We know about those. Uh, the translation of those impacts to the deep sea, not all of those impacts will translate. So, for example, the idea with some of these mining machines is that you would pick up this resource, you'd bring that resource to this, the ship and you'd bring the ship to land and all of the smelting, et cetera, 
would be done on land, the tilings would be generated on land, et cetera. Um, and so there would still be land-based impacts, um, even though the mining is not occurring on land. Likewise, one of the things that's being discussed is when ships are collecting the resource off the seafloor, they would do some initial kind of sifting of the material and there would be a kind of a slurry of waste material that would need to be disposed of. It doesn't make sense to bring that on the ship back to land. And so there would be kind of a pipe to disperse that slurry somewhere in the water column above the seafloor. And so part of the discussion is what depth should that be that slurry be ejected at? Will it have impacts to the you know, migratory species or sessile organisms? If they get all the stuff raining down on them, will they be able to survive? So there's very few studies on uh, that kind of scale, um, but some of them are being started and many more are needed. So right now, there are some pollution impacts that won't translate, but there are other pollution impacts that we don't yet know um, because we don't have data for. I hope I answered that question. Um, feel free to ask a follow-up if needed. Thanks, Beth. Uh, next question is about uh, the study that you mentioned where they saw that there were no recovery of the animals on the seafloor after 35 years. And just wondering what type of animals you might expect to find that far down in the ocean. Are they only microscopic life or are they larger species as well? Oh, yeah. Sorry if I didn't make that clear. Uh, so these pictures don't necessarily do it justice. What the diversity of animals are like uh, on the seafloor. I wish I included a different slide that showed some of the other types of animals that you find. So you have both uh, motile organisms, so animals that can move around, like fishes, sea cucumbers, crabs, um, and then you also have animals that have to attach to something. And actually that's why manganese nodules are an interesting seafloor feature because most of the seafloor is this squishy sediment and animals that need to anchor to something uh, don't like sediment because they get buried. So they like to attach to hard substrate. So those are things like sponges, deep sea corals, um, some of which can be you know, hundreds of years old, um, uh, are just some examples of you know, things you can see with your eyes if you went down there with a camera. Um, and so uh, if you don't have the hard attached organisms, you will also have fewer of the motile organisms because there's less things for them to eat. Um, so for instance, brittle stars, they're motile. When you go down to these ecosystems, you often find brittle stars like crawling up inside um, the deep sea corals. And that's what, you know, they're getting their food up there because they want to be off the seafloor. And so if you didn't have those deep sea corals because the manganese nodules were gone, then you would also have fewer of those brittle stars. And so you can see in that picture on the right with all the little, you know, trails in the sediment, that there's got to be quite a few organisms moving around in those ecosystems. Uh, to leave those trails. So it's not just microscopic stuff that no one cares about, it's also um, larger animals that connect to the larger ocean ecosystem. Yeah, thanks for the question. Beth, the next question is about the essential biological relationship that you mentioned between minerals and microbes, and wondering what that is. Um, I'm not sure I understand that question all of the way, but I'll try to answer it. So I think the question is, you know, what is the importance of microbes in rock environments? Um, and so I brought back up this, uh, actually, let me bring up a different picture. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Scrolling, 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 here we go. Let's go back to this picture. Um, so one of the most essential things that microbes do is they use chemical energy from these environments to form new food. So uh, if you're at the bottom of the ocean, it's kind of a hard life. Uh, most of the time you're just waiting for food to rain down on you. So maybe like a whale falls or something, you know, whale dies and sinks to the seafloor or, you know, all the accumulated fecal matter and other stuff that's formed in the surface of the ocean sinks down and other organisms kind of scavenge off that. So that would mean that the ecosystem is entirely dependent on what happens at the surface. But actually there are organisms on the seafloor, microbes, that can use chemical energy to make new organic matter. And so they can provide an additional food source to the deep sea. Um, and as I mentioned, this is really important at active hydrothermal vents. The scale of its importance in rocky environments, like what I'm showing you here, is not well understood. 
So in some studies, it suggests that 50% of the base of the food web is from microbes creating this new organic matter. In other places, the, it might be more dependent on what rains down. Um, and so what we do in my group is try to understand like how fast do microbes make that food? How fast do they fix carbon? How much iron are they cycling? How much oxygen are they breathing? Um, and you know, how much nutrients are they regenerating? Um, so hopefully I've answered that question, um, but follow up with me if I didn't quite get it. Great. Next question is on, uh, what is the current best theory for why the Gulf of Maine is warming rapidly? Oh, <laughs> okay. I will do my best to answer this question, um, but it is definitely not my area of expertise and many of my other colleagues at Bigelow could probably do it better justice. Um, but what I will say, actually I don't know what I'm looking for here because there's no picture of the Gulf of Maine in my talk, but um, the Gulf of Maine as a body of water is warming, I think 99% faster than most bodies of water on the ocean. And part of that is due to how water circulates in the Gulf of Maine. So for those of you who think about the Gulf of Maine a lot, there's kind of a canyon um, entrance um, off to the, the uh, kind of southeast side. And that allows cold water that comes down from Canada to enter the Gulf of Maine. And that cold water is really helpful for species like lobster, um, uh, copepods that are the food source for right whales, et cetera. And so as ocean circulation is changing in general, there's less and less of that cold water coming in. Uh, and so that's changing the circulation in the Gulf and allowing the water to get warmer, abnormally warm. Um, and so it's a kind of a global climate problem, but that's amplified in our Gulf of Maine um, area. Um, I will stop my answer there again, because it's not my area of expertise, but I'm happy to connect whoever had that question with some of my colleagues who study this data in detail. Thanks. Uh, next question is about uh, how far down into the seafloor do the manganese nodules go? Oh yeah, thanks for asking that question. Let's go back to my map, wherever it is. Um, so these kind of purple blobs on my map representing where manganese nodules are. These are in an area of the seafloor called the abyssal plain. It's kind of like really flat and it's very extensive. And on average, those features are between four and five kilometers of water depth. So that's like three-ish miles below the sea surface, which is where that seafloor is. Um, and so that's one of the big hurdles for the deep sea mining industry is how to uh, viably get rocks up from three miles below the seafloor, uh, below the sea surface. Uh, the red areas where those um, uh, hydrothermal sulfides are, those are a bit shallower because they're underwater mountains, that's where they form. Um, and then the seamounts that represent the cobalt crust, they vary in depth. Um, they can be quite shallow, they can also be very deep. It just depends on how big the underwater mountain is. Yeah. Uh, next question is on why the U.S. has not joined the Convention on the Wall of the Sea. Oh, I, I do not have a good answer to that question. <laughs> Um, and I have many uh, legal friends who would love to spend hours talking about it. It comes down to politics. Um, when, you know, this, the Convention on the Law of Sea was originally proposed, there was some initial interest, but it requires uh, many Congress people to agree to sign on to this international convention. And for various political reasons, there wasn't enough political will at that time. Over time, and so this is decades long, right? This convention came out quite a while ago. There have been additional efforts to try to revive interest. We can still sign on to it on, at any time, um, but there has to be political will um, from the populace to do it and from our representatives to do it. Um, and right now that doesn't exist. The thought at the time uh, was that, you know, we didn't want to enter into an international treaty uh, or convention and ha not have the ability to do what we wanted was kind of the short version of that answer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, in the areas in your map that show where tracks are being uh, explored for mining in international waters, who decides where those parcels are located? Um, so maybe first to 
Um, I'm wondering if two different ideas are slightly mixed up, so I'll try to explain them a little bit better. Um, so I'll go back to my initial map about the tracks of where to explore. So these, this track information represents essentially where ships go and where we have been able to map. Um, so you'll see a lot of it connects like major shipping ports to other major shipping ports. So we have pretty good area mapping in those areas, connecting highly populated areas. And the places that are not well uh, filled in are places that ships don't go to very often. Uh, and so there is no one necessarily prioritizing what parts of the seafloor have been mapped. It's basically just what is easiest to get mapped. Um, within the scientific community, uh, for instance, within the you know, discussions with US agencies about where should we go map, there is prioritization about where we think is the most interesting information. Uh, so for instance, there's this new executive order to prioritize mapping in the US exclusive economic zone to better understand our mineral resources. So there'll be efforts to try to fill in the map in the US, especially around um, uh, the Pacific Islands um, that are part of the US EEZ. Uh, but otherwise, there isn't like an international program to decide that. In contrast, um, if we think about this map and where places are being considered, that's basically driven by where these resources exist. So that's a natural feature. And then the International Seabed Authority is then deciding how, you know, any, um, uh, any state that's part of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea can request a lease um, to explore part of that seafloor. Um, and so the International Seabed Authority evaluates those requests and then gives out those permissions for those exploration. Um, and so that's, you know, a separate division, uh, you know, that has its own voting body, et cetera. Um, and that's how that's decided. I hope I answered that question. Thanks, Beth. Uh, we've got time for one more and maybe we'll end on kind of a lighter note. Uh, you've got to go to a place that few people have been on the, in the, uh, on the planet uh, to the bottom of the seafloor and wondering what the coolest thing you've seen from a submarine is. Ha! Yeah, that's a fun question. Um, the very first submarine dive I ever got to do was in the Gulf of Mexico and a place where there are natural uh, oil and gas seeps. Um, so many of you know that the Gulf of Mexico is full of oil offshore oil and gas. There's also places where oil and gas naturally seep out of the seafloor and again, support these really weird and strange animal communities. And I got to dive there for the very first time um, and see out the window um, places where oil is like bubbling out of the seafloor and there's animals that are, survive around those ecosystems. And that was really amazing to see. Um, Likewise, to see a hydrothermal vent right out the window, like you will never be able to see that on land because the high pressures at the bottom of the ocean allow that water to get so, so hot. Um, and so you can't see that on land. It's something that very few people have ever seen. So that's just really cool. Uh, 